Uh, my name is Jennifer Preston. I am delighted to be uh, here with you this afternoon. I am uh, coming to you from an Ashnabic uh, territory in southwestern Ontario, and I am going to be the moderator for um, this session. So I'm just going to open us up a bit um, uh, before we get started. Our side event, uh, as you know, uh, I hope you know that this is what you, the room you've come to, is on sustainable development and the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, um, particularly on sustainable development as a human right. Um, and so I am going to, uh, in just a moment, I'm gonna introduce our speakers. Um, but before I do that, I just would like to uh, go over a few things. So um, as I said, my name is Jennifer Preston. I uh, coordinate Indigenous rights work at the Canadian Friends Service Committee, which is the justice arm of Quakers in Canada. Um, I also coordinate informally the Coalition for the Human Rights of Indigenous Peoples. The coalition has been around a couple of decades at this point, came together during the development of the UN Declaration when the UN Declaration was in development in Geneva, and it came together as a group of organizations and individuals who uh, shared um, the objective of getting a declaration adopted. And we've stayed together uh, informally for a few decades decades now doing work on, um, well, first, of course, achieving the declaration, now implementing the declaration. And of course, we're very active in the last few years on achieving federal legislation to implement the UN declaration. So one of the projects that we got involved in uh, about a year or so ago was um, this sustainable development project. We wanted to look at, when we looked at the work <laughs> that was being done on the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. We weren't seeing enough connection to Indigenous people's human rights. And so we decided that we would undertake some research around that connection, the connection between uh, not just the SDGs, but the whole 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And so out of that, one of the things that... Um, uh, we are doing is holding a, well, we're doing a whole one-year project, and, and part of that is the development of resources, um, but also in addition to that, and some of those, some of which you're going to see as part of this side event, but in addition to that, we are also planning a large hybrid symposium, um, which we've had to postpone once, of course, because of COVID, but um, we will be uh, hosting at, we'll be welcomed at the University of British Columbia who are hosting our uh, side event. And we will be um, having this hybrid event, which brings together experts to talk about the linkages between the UN Declaration, Indigenous Peoples Human Rights, and the 2030 Agenda and the SDGs. So um, this symposium is coming up April 6th and 7th. And as I said, it is a hybrid. People will be able to join virtually. So I know that uh, my colleague will be posting um, information about how you can uh, get more information on that symposium and learn about that symposium. Uh, so that's uh, this uh, actually doing this side event as part of this conference is really also part of this project, this larger project of trying to develop resources and raise awareness on the relationship between uh, the work on sustainable development and implementing Indigenous people's human rights as of articulated in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So our first speaker today is Cheryl Lightfoot. Professor Cheryl Lightfoot is Anishinaabe, a citizen of the Lake Superior Band of Ojibwe. She is currently serving as the North American representative to the United Nations Expert Mechanism on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, or MRIP. Um, she is also the Canada Research Chair in Global Indigenous Rights and Politics, and she is an Associate Professor in Political Science, the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs and Indigenous Studies at the University of British Columbia. She serves as the Senior Advisor to the President at UBC on Indigenous Affairs, and she is leading the implementation of the 2020 Indigenous Strategic Plan across UBC. Uh, and I would note that that strategic plan also very much speaks to implementing the UN Declaration in a university campus setting. And if you're interested in that, you can just go to UBC's website to learn more about that. 
uh, the UBC Indigenous Strategic Plan. Our second speaker is lawyer Paul Joff. Paul is a member of the Quebec and Ontario Bars, and he specializes in human rights concerning Indigenous peoples at the international and domestic level. Internationally, Paul has been actively involved in the standard setting processes, including the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and also the American Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples at the Organization of American States. For the past three decades, Paul has represented the Grand Council of the Crees Euistchi uh, and the Cree Nation government. And I'd say that it's been my privilege to work uh, closely with both Paul and Cheryl for many, many years on our on jointly our joint work on the implementation of Indigenous peoples' human rights. Now I'm going to uh, uh, ask Cheryl to speak first, and Cheryl, after Cheryl has done her short presentation, um, we'll be handing the microphone over to Paul. I am absolutely delighted to be with you here today as part of this panel. And I'm gonna start us off with a very brief high level overview of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and how it provides all of us, um, Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples, a guiding framework for Indigenous engagement. And then we're gonna particularly consider it, of course, in light of the SDGs, the Strategic Development Goals. So in my few minutes um, setting the stage, I will all too briefly and all too quickly cover uh, some of the key points about the origins, the rationale, and the history of the UN Declaration. This will allow us to take a look at what the Declaration is and what implementation of it means. And then we'll touch on just some opening thoughts on how we can translate all of us, the Declaration's principles into practice, particularly in light of the SDGs. So I said this would be a brief uh, journey, high level, so we have to step back quickly um, to the 1960s and recall that at that point, the foundational human rights instruments in place recognized and supported a set of basic inherent human rights. And these rights were everything from social and cultural to civic and political. And they also included by that time, a strong norm against racial discrimination discrimination, as well as the inherent right of all peoples to self-determination. And together that formed the basis of the decolonization project that transformed the map of our world from a set of empires that we, that we had seen in the early 20th century to a very colorful map of more than 100 independent states by the end of the 20th century. However, None of these universal and inherent human rights reflected the unique Indigenous people's experience. And in many respects, Indigenous people were largely absent and excluded. And in fact, there were a couple of ways that Indigenous peoples were actively excluded and erased from the human rights advances of the post-World War II period through a set of discriminatory legal doctrines. So very briefly, we wanna first consider the doctrine of discovery. And this is actually a set of international legal principles that originated way back in the 15th and 16th century with papal bulls that justified European discovery, claim and exertions of sovereignty and control over non-European, non-Christian lands and peoples. And the doctrine began and perpetuated a very long-standing myth that indigenous peoples for one reason or another should have limitations on their right to self-determination, that somehow they have lesser rights than other peoples. Secondly, an important doctrine was the saltwater thesis, which during the 20th century's massive decolonization project excluded deliberately indigenous peoples from the right to decolonization. And ironically, during the 1950s and 60s, when discussions were occurring globally on the right to self-determination specifically and decolonization, the leading powers of the time determined that they could discriminate against indigenous peoples 
And so indigenous peoples were left ineligible for decolonization under that program and relegated to what it was essentially a second class version of the right to self-determination. And it is these problematic legal doctrines which have helped create a hierarchy of rights concerning Europeans on the one hand and others, and including and especially indigenous peoples. And if we look to the Canadian context in particular, these doctrines helped provide the rationale for a legal framework of colonialism here, including such things as settlement of lands without indigenous consent, like we have in BC, and some other parts in Canada, uh, as well as the deeply colonial and patriarchal Indian Act. And it also provided, of course, the legal basis for the Indian residential school system. The UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is the antidote to this colonial and discriminatory framework. It's the correction. It is, as the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada articulated in 2015 in its final report, the appropriate framework for reconciliation in this country. So if we all want to move together on domestic and global agendas like sustainable development, we absolutely must do so in a manner consistent with the UN Declaration. It's important to understand that what eventually became this declaration <clears throat> was not a top-down UN initiative, but it all started with elders and knowledge keepers and activists and advocates sitting together and having conversations beginning in the 1970s. And they discussed what the future should look like, how indigenous peoples understand themselves, their governance, their sovereignty, their relationships to one another and the natural world, and how perhaps those could be articulated through a Western legal language of rights and what the nature of indigenous and non-indigenous relationships should look like going forward. And two grassroots groups in particular began to organize in the mid 1970s, one on each side of the 49th parallel, the International Indian Treaty Council on the South side and the World Council of Indigenous Peoples on the Northern side. And both groups produced important declaration of principles, which would be their mandate going forward into international space in order to advocate for indigenous rights. And both of these groups gathered together at the first International Indigenous Peoples Meeting in Geneva in 1977. And to make a very long and complex story all too short, 40 years later, what became the UN Declaration passed the UN General Assembly. Still, even after all those years, what was the final UN declaration bears a very strong resemblance to those early declarations that came from the grassroots level. Passed by the UN General Assembly and now written in human rights language, the document still reflects the essence of what those grassroots groups in the 1970s said was the pathway forward to indigenous people's individual and collective well being sustainable lifeways and good relationships between indigenous and non-indigenous sectors of society. The declaration is an articulation of what indigenous well-being and sustainable existence looks like, both for individuals and collectives. A few key points about the UN declaration. It's important to understand that as a human rights declaration, it represents the bare minimum standard of indigenous people's human rights. Apologies. It's often said that it's the floor of indigenous people's rights, not the ceiling. It was negotiated article by article and sometimes word for word or even letter by letter between states and indigenous peoples over those 40 years. And in fact, it's the first human rights instrument that included the rights holders themselves in the discussions, its development and its negotiation. As a human rights declaration, similar to the 1948 Universal Declaration on Human Rights, it represents a global consensus. It includes both individual and collective human rights. And as the UN states, this declaration established a 
universal framework of minimum standards for the survival, dignity, and well being of the Indigenous peoples of the world. And of course, it's also a guidebook for good relations between Indigenous and non Indigenous peoples. And as such, we should look to it to guide policy development, negotiations, and even litigation. Self determination is the heart of this document. This document's remedial. It's intended to correct centuries of marginalization, discrimination, and dispossession, all of which denied Indigenous peoples their fundamental right to self-determination. Therefore, it's firmly grounded in the universal right to self-determination. This is the fundamental of the Declaration from which all other rights flow. The document affirms that Indigenous peoples may remain distinct peoples if they wish from surrounding societies. It supports all existing treaties and other agreements. Considering sustainable development particularly, it affirms the right of Indigenous peoples to pursue their own visions of development and also requires respect for Indigenous jurisdictions and their own decision-making processes. And it also calls for the full and effective participation in larger decision-making processes on issues that may affect Indigenous peoples. And I wanna take just a few minutes to address some recent legislation in Canada. BC's DRIPA Act, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act, and the federal UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act that began as Bill C-15. Both of these pieces of legislation officially and clearly repudiate doctrines of superiority and colonialism. They affirm that the UN Declaration as an international human rights instrument has application in Canadian law. They set out a collaborative, cooperative process to align the laws of Canada and British Columbia with the UN Declaration. Both pieces of legislation require annual reporting on implementation and they enshrine commitments into law so that it will be so that they will be more transparent and be more difficult to ignore or overturn in time. And I wanna close with this direct quote from the preamble of the Federal UN Declaration Act, which ties the declaration specifically to the need for sustainable development. Whereas the implementation of the declaration can contribute to supporting sustainable development and responding to growing concerns relating to climate change and its impacts on indigenous peoples. So I will stop there and I look forward to hearing uh, from my fellow panelists and back to you, Jennifer. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Um, and I just wanna say that I am uh, uh, amazed and thrilled with how you took us on a more than um, 40 year journey uh, in um, less than 10 minutes, well done. Um, uh, and now I'm going to just hand the mic over to Paul Joff, and uh, Paul is going to speak to um, sustainable development as a human right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, I'd like to thank my two colleagues who did an excellent job of giving us a context and history. I'll be a little more specific. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to join you today. And I will be focusing on the rights of Indigenous peoples and the critical issues of sustainable development and climate change. From the outset, it is worth noting the interrelationship between sustainable development and climate change. The less that a proposed development is sustainable, the more likely that such development will contribute to the growing climate emergency. Let's begin with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which to date has been reaffirmed by the UN General Assembly by consensus at least 14 times. The preamble of the UN Declaration refers to sustainable and equitable development. This phrase suggests 
that proposed developments in indigenous territories must be both sustainable from an environmental perspective and also be fair. In the UN Declaration, Article 7.2 affirms, and I quote, Indigenous peoples have the collective right to live in freedom, peace, and security as distinct peoples. When Article 7.2 is combined with Article 20, which deals with subsistence, we have the right to food and water security. When Article 7.2 is combined with Article 26, lands, territories, and resources, we have territorial security. When Article 7.2 is combined with Article 29.1, which is conservation and protection of the environment, we have environmental security. And when combined with Articles 8 and 31, relating to forced assimilation and culture, we have cultural security. Further, Articles 23 and 32, Paragraph 2, affirm Indigenous peoples' right to determine and develop priorities and strategies for the development or use of their lands, territories, and resources. When all these provisions that I have cited in the UN Declaration are read together, Indigenous peoples have the right to sustainable development. Now, it is also worth noting that the American Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which was adopted by the Organization of American States in Washington, D.C., in June 2016, affirms in Article Roman numeral 19, Indigenous peoples have the right to live in harmony with nature and to a healthy, safe, and sustainable environment, essential conditions for the full enjoyment of the rights to life and to their spirituality, cosmovision, and collective well-being. And the second paragraph continues, Indigenous peoples have the right to conserve, restore, and protect the environment and to manage their lands, territories, and resources in a sustainable way. In the Federal Act respecting the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, it is affirmed in the preamble that, and I quote, the Government of Canada recognizes that all relations with Indigenous peoples must be based on the recognition and implementation of the inherent right to self-determination, including the right to self-government. In the same act, it is affirmed in the preamble, and I quote, the implementation of the declaration can contribute to supporting sustainable development and responding to growing concerns relating to climate change and its impacts on Indigenous peoples, which I believe Cheryl also referred to. Now, depending on the facts and law in each case, Indigenous peoples may well have a legal, legally enforceable right to sustainable development. On October 8, 2021, the UN Human Rights Council adopted Resolution 4813 by consensus, which was entitled The Human Right to a Clean, Healthy, and sustainable environment. There were four abstaining countries, China, India, Japan, and Russian Federation. However, such abstentions have no legal effect on this consensus resolution. The resolution recognized, and I quote, the impact of climate change, the unsustainable management and use of natural resources, the pollution of air, land, and water, the unsound management of chemicals and waste, the resulting loss of biodiversity, and the decline in services provided by ecosystems interfere 
with the enjoyment of a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. And that environmental damage has negative implications, both direct and indirect, for the effective enjoyment of all human rights. In addition, the resolution cautioned, and I quote again, recognizing further that environmental degradation, climate change, and unsustainable development constitute some of the most pressing and serious threats to the ability of present and future generations to enjoy human rights including the right to life. However, the same UN, uh, UN Human Rights Council positively concluded, section one, recognizes the right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment as a human right that is important for the enjoyment of human rights. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, and thank you for that uh, uh, very specific language coming out of the UN around sustainable development and obviously around climate change and the connections between uh, ongoing um, devastation and human rights. Um, and obviously that all completely relates to what we're talking about here today in terms of Indigenous people's human rights, sustainable development, and obviously also, um, you know, the overarching theme with this conference when looking at the SDGs. So um, now that we've had those two presentations to get us going, before we go into a dialogue with the participants that are here today, um, I'm going to introduce one more of my colleagues who somehow managed to evade um, having a bio. Um, and so I'm going to introduce Craig Benjamin, who's actually been um, the lead researcher on our uh, project on sustainable development and the relationship to the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And Craig is going to just show us a few of the resources that this project has already developed um, and that uh, we'll share them here today and make links available where you can see them. And after we've looked at those resources, then we'll come back and we're gonna be having a dialogue with uh, Paul and with Cheryl. So Great, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, I'll start just by taking people quickly to the um, website of the Coalition for the Human Rights of Indigenous Peoples and hoping that this will be really useful to a number of people who are taking part in the session today. We have just today launched two new fact sheets, uh, both on the, the very topic of this symposium, looking at the interconnections between the human rights framework at the international level respecting the rights of Indigenous peoples and the implementation of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So these two fact sheets are uh, available off the coalition website. They're uh, quite short. Uh, they include within them uh, some uh, infographics as well as a, as a narrative. Uh, and there's gonna be more resources like this coming out that will be posted on this website. Uh, in addition to the, the print materials, we are lucky to be working with Ellen Gabriel, uh, an amazing artist uh, and a community activist who is leading the creation of a number of videos. And just to give you a bit of a taste of this, this work and also of the, the upcoming symposium itself, we are going to um, share with you, and I think I have to do this in two steps, uh, share with you uh, a, a video that she's created uh, featuring one of the speakers from the symposium and this is about a minute and a half in length. My name is Julian Napoleon, and I'm mixed ancestry, um, Ghanesa, Cree, Iroquois, and Ukrainian. I work now as a head grower at our native plant nursery. You know, right now, from my home here on the reserve, I could actually be, meet most of my needs on foot without even burning fossil fuels. I can walk down to the river and launch my canoe and set a net. I can grow lots of food and, and snare rabbits. And, and you know, I, I, being able to still live that way, to me, that is the most sustainable thing. And so when I think about sustainable development, how could development fit within uh, a world where I could continue and the future generations in my community could continue to 
have such a rich abundance around them. back to you then, Jennifer. Great. Thanks so much, Craig. Um, so great to uh, see the video. And, and just to let people know, Ellen Gabriel is working on a whole series of videos for us um, that will be uh, on the website as well. And um, uh, talking to some of the presenters at our symposium. Um, so we're really excited about this video series. Um, uh, one of the things that I want to ask uh, for Paul uh, Paul, following up on your presentation, um, what would you say is the impact of, uh, like, what will be the impact of recognizing sustainable um, development as a human right? And is that going to change the nature of federal, provincial, and territorial obligations? Um, and our, how or can we use this um, to our advantage as we advocate for human rights and for um, the environment? So I'm, I'm just going to give that one to Paul. Uh, first of all, I strongly believe that, and I'm sure my colleagues do as well, based on past conversations, that sustainable development will be a positive benefit to everyone. In fact, with climate change and what's coming, and we saw some of that in BC when there was those awful floods, et cetera, and the fires, um, we can't afford not to implement sustainable uh, climate change and in the context of su sustainable development. Uh, so yes, there will be some pushback. There are certain provinces who uh, don't even support the UN declaration, uh, but overall, there's no doubt that whether these provinces do implement sustainable development, I believe the courts in dealing with the challenges that are coming and which already exist will apply uh, you know, environmental laws and use the UN Declaration and perhaps also the American Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples to ensure that all provinces and territories uh, you know, implement sustainable development. As the last point, I'll just mention that in the Yukon, there's an excellent legislation on sustainable development, perhaps the best in the country. Uh, that'll be for you to decide, but it's really worth uh, reading it to see the detail and how much thought they've given to the many dimensions that would be necessary if we're going to respect sustainable development. Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, now I have a question um, specifically for Cheryl. Uh, Cheryl, I'm uh, just wanting to follow up on the fact that in fact, the province of British Columbia was out in front of the federal government um, in adopting uh, provincial legislation to implement the UN declaration. And I'm wondering if you could just uh, tell us a bit about how you see that that's unfolding that legislation and um, implementing the legislation. And also if you see any specific connections to that work and to the uh, SDGs. Oh, thanks, Jennifer. Um, I appreciate the question. Um, it's a, um, I would say ongoing issue to watch on, on the daily or weekly basis. Um, there's a lot of activity going on. And, and Paul, I wanna thank you for the tip about the legislation in the Yukon on uh, sustainable development. I'm going to um, go look for that. I'm also aware, uh, parenthetically, before I answer your question, Jennifer, uh, the Yukon also has a Universities Act uh, that's fairly recent that is strongly grounded in principles of the UN Declaration and collaboration with uh, the nations in the Yukon. So I think the Yukon is a place to watch for some very progressive uh, legislation and movements. So thanks for that. Um, and. Um, yeah, back to BC and the legislation. Um, the, 
there are a couple key points about the legislation in BC that I think are worth background points that I think are worth um, spending just a few minutes on. Um, when the legislation came forward uh, in 2019, um, it was quite an extraordinary set of historical circumstances. And of course, this was the pre COVID days, um, just barely. So when the legislation was announced, um, it was announced cooperatively between the First Nations Leadership Council and the Legislative Assembly. Um, and it was done very publicly uh, with um, Indigenous um, participation and in the ceremony. Um, it was about a half day event and, and it was an extraordinary experience sitting in the Legislative Assembly in Victoria. And it was that spirit of collaboration and cooperation that grounded that piece of legislation, set the tone for not only its development and its, its consultation practices, it, it, it really set a new tone, not just in that it was going to be setting a pathway to implement the declaration in the province, but it was setting a new tone for how relationships were going to play out between Indigenous people and non-Indigenous people in the province. And I think that's really fundamental. It, it's, it's not only the piece of legislation that was new, it was really strong movements in how people were working together and what, what sort of broad, um, and I hate to call it consultation because that sounds too thin. Um, it was actually a deeper engagement. It's, it's, it was a co-development, a co-management, a co-governance. And I think that's a fundamental shift that's a positive and something that we really need to pay attention to as we do work in all of these areas uh, that pertain to Indigenous peoples. Now, COVID has created, of course, some complications along with massive fires and floods and all kinds of other um, events in British Columbia that have been catastrophic uh, on a scale um, almost unimaginable. Um, but through that, there's been continued work on the action plan here in BC. Um, the first, uh, one of the pieces of the legislation in BC is that there's an annual report required. And so there was a, the first annual report posted on, on BC's website the very first year. Um, I, I think we could consider that the baseline. It was a very extensive report, and I'm not sure that we could say that all of that was done between the fall of 2019 and the summer of 2020. So I think we could consider that first report to be a, a baseline from which we can draw um, ongoing reports. There has been work on the provincial action plan, which is also required in the legislation. Uh, there have been criticisms that it's slow. Um, and I think there are a number of reasons that it has not moved as quickly as possible. COVID being one, the natural disasters that have happened being two. And third is a very difficult one that we all will need to contend with moving forward is the capacity of Indigenous peoples to engage at the same pace and at the same level as um, the, the province, quite frankly. And um, while there are some, some funding mechanisms in place to enhance that participation, First Nations are um, dealing with the on the ground, real life issues of the fires and the floods and the COVID. And so funding doesn't always um, make up for that uh, human capacity issue. So I think moving forward, one of the things that we need to be very attentive to in this province is how we're gonna mitigate uh, that huge difference in, in capacity. Um, and so I think, you can't get away from the obvious connection that the climate change crises that have happened here um, and the heavy impacts that each one of those fires, floods, COVID and disproportionate impacts that those have had on First Nations in this province. I think the connection to the SDGs and sustainable development and sustainable environments is absolutely obvious and and we need to move forward all of those and um, the draft provincial action plan was posted on the website uh, for a while 
um, the latter part of 2021 for Indigenous Engagement First. Um, there are a number of connections there to principles of the SDGs, and so I can definitely say it's it's front of people's minds as uh, as we think back about all of the the activities of 2021 and moving into 2022 so more to come uh, there'll be further rounds of engagement and consultation with uh, continuing with indigenous people and following with uh, non-indigenous people in the province great thank you Cheryl and maybe I'll just add to um, uh, we were talking about the BC um, situation there but uh, for those who aren't aware, the uh, federal government is um, in the very beginning stages of discussions around what will the national action plan um, for implementing the UN declaration look like. And it is um, uh, that federal national action plan is due to parliament in uh, June of 2023, which will be two years after the adoption of the legislation, because that's a piece of the legislation. So that's another piece of work that is still in the uh, very much in the development stage, um, early development stage, and a very critical um, work uh, being done there around what does it actually look like to implement the UN Declaration in Canada. Um, and so this, as Cheryl says, more to come. Um, I just want to make sure that everyone got the information about the uh, conference, the symposium that we will, the hybrid symposium that we will be hosting at the University of British Columbia. So it is April 6th and 7th. It is a hybrid. Um, the evening of the 6th will be a reception and a keynote presentation from Daly Sambo Duro. Um, Daly was one of the key negotiators on the UN Declaration. Um, and, uh, and then on the seventh, we have a series of three panels, um, each with um, uh, some experts uh, delivering very short presentations on their area of work. And then a long period, I think about an hour for each one of discussion for all the people attending, not just for the panelists. So we're hoping that this symposium really is an opportunity for people to dialogue and, and frankly, to um, extend the dialogue, increase the dialogue around these topics. And out of that, um, our, dear, our dear colleague Craig will be um, uh, constructing an outcome document um, from, from these discussions, which we will be publishing. Um, and so, uh, yep, the, we are, it is hybrid. We will have the link available for, we are having some people in person in UBC. Um, at least that's our plan. And we sure hope that is the going to be what's happening. Um, but we will have many more people um, attending this symposium online. Um, uh, okay, so now I have another question um, from, and I would say too, before I get to this question, I would say for those of you who are attending this conference and perhaps the UN declaration is something that's um, you know not necessarily uh, you're in your sphere of work normally, and maybe the material is fairly new to you. Both Paul and Cheryl are um, internationally um, known experts on the UN Declaration. So I would urge people to feel free to ask questions about the UN Declaration um, uh, while you have the opportunity with these um, experts here today. Um, and so uh, the question that we have here from the audience is, uh, is there anything that non-governmental organizations whose mandates focus on sustainable development um, should be doing to support uh, the adoption and implementation of the declaration. So NGOs whose mandates are on sustainable development and how can they be involved in the implementation of the declaration? And um, uh, who would like to address that question? We probably both have something to say. Um, Paul, do you want to take it first and then I'll follow up? Because uh, you, you have the legal hat and then I have uh, really the on the ground politics hat. So maybe between the two of us, we can give a comprehensive answer. Why don't you go first, Paul? Um, well, in terms of NGOs, I think one of the most, there are two key aspects, I believe for NGOs, if I can suggest anything. And that is to really gain an understanding of the UN Declaration and what the different provisions entail. And the second uh, point is 
that because indigenous peoples in Canada are so diverse and the history, as you know, has been uh, you know, quite uh, not the best history, let's say, in terms of Canada, including with residential schools, there's a certain sensitivity that is definitely necessary in order to really take into account the different indigenous contexts across the country. And there are huge challenges. And if NGOs take the time to communicate and also to learn what these challenges are on the many levels and how they interrelate, and then bring in the UN Declaration and perhaps uh, the American Declaration, because they both work together, um, that would be a good start, I believe, for NGOs. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. Um, I get asked similar questions quite a bit. Um, and of course, working on this in a university space, um, I get asked a similar question. So what could professors or in university staff do um, to implement the declaration? And I've been asked it by municipalities or community-based organizations. What can we do? Um, you know, the, they take a look at the declaration and the 46 articles plus the preambular paragraphs, it seems so big and so broad and comprehensive. And people have expressed to me sometimes overwhelming. Um, and so in, in a practical way, I, I completely agree with Paul, um, gain the education and also focus on a few areas where you see yourself and your work and then think about how you can action um, those areas. And I always um, invite my students as well in our very first class, read the declaration and come prepared to speak about two or three of those articles that really speak to you, uh, where you sit in the world and in, in your day-to-day -day life and your work and how can you see action in them. And then when I give advice about how to do UN declaration work in your daily life, I've got a set of five, what I call principles for putting um, the UN declaration, make, moving it from principles to practice and five things to keep in mind um, that can guide your work as an NGO or a municipality or a professor. First of all, acknowledging and supporting indigenous self-determination. Look for it, find out who your indigenous community neighbors are, whether they're your coworkers, whether you are on their lands, find out who they are and find out what their vision of self-determination is and support that, um, engage with them. Two, um, this is a very simple human one, mutual respect, um, form a relationship uh, that's mutually respectful, engage in dialogue, um, create that space. Thirdly, reciprocity. Whatever you take, give something back. Make it a two-way street um, so that it, again, becomes a relationship. Fourth, wherever possible, think about relationships in terms of collaboration, co-development, co-governance, and also check and make sure that that's a model uh, that is appropriate and desired uh, by the indigenous communities that you are interacting with. And then fifth, overall, um, this is about relationships. Uh, so always maintain a relational approach uh, grounded in ongoing dialogue, ongoing discussion, ongoing negotiation. Um, so those are just my general advice uh, for anyone wanting to do declaration work in a broad um, behavioral pattern. It's a great question and I really appreciate it. And uh, NGOs in particular have a lot of space here. That's great, thank you. And maybe I'll just add to Paul and Cheryl's remarks. And I think that um, uh, it's probably uh, not news to people here that sometimes um, we see there can be a little bit of a tension between environmental NGOs and Indigenous rights work. Um, and so I think that, and as Paul said, you know, um, there's a history there to, uh, to be very aware of. And so, you know, as someone who works for an NGO and not a settler-based NGO, 
um, I can say that I think that it is really important to do your education. Don't expect your Indigenous partners to do that work for you. Um, and, and as we've already said, there's a lot of information on the coalition's website about the declaration itself. Um, and remembering that, um, you know, respecting Indigenous people's human rights and respecting Indigenous people's right of self-determination means that sometimes you may not be in agreement, um, but, but you need to hold those tensions and uh, also examine why, where, where is your uh, uh, space coming from or perhaps even bias coming from. And so I think that's a really important thing, but there's a lot of space for NGOs working on sustainable development to be supporting indigenous peoples. And particularly, and this brings me to our next question. Um, I think a lot of times when we hear in the media about the UN declaration, um, we are hearing about it in the context of resource development. And obviously um, I think for uh, uh, for people who are working on sustainable development and NGOs that are working on sustainable development, obviously um, ongoing resource development is a, a, it can be a big challenge and um, uh, you know big concerns about resource development that is not sustainable. So, but the question that I have for our panelists is: so, if we set aside um, uh, those provisions that are directly around resource development. Um, for just the moment, I think it would also be useful to hear a little bit about the provisions in the declaration um, in relationship specifically to SDGs. Um, what other provisions would you like to highlight rather than necessarily the resource development provisions uh, with relationship to um, the sustainable development goals? Well, the SDGs are quite uh, broad. There are some... <laughs> general aspects that are worth keeping in mind, such as well-being, which sometimes can cross into a number of SDGs. And of course, the UN Declaration mentions that it's the minimum standard for the um, survival, dignity, and well-being of the Indigenous peoples of the world. And um, well-being has always been probably the most important aspect in dealing with the different uh, provisions in the declaration. And so anytime we were involved in the drafting, that was always a standard that was, you know, one of the standards that were foremost in our minds. Um, because the declaration includes such a wide range of subjects, environment, not only lands and territories, um, health, there's just so many areas, social, economic, cultural development. And um, I would suggest that it would be perhaps easier if people focused on which SDGs were of particular interest to them or they felt would be a priority for Indigenous peoples and one can ask Indigenous peoples and you may get different uh, responses as to what may be priorities because it's so broad. And um, I would suggest going in that way to, to address it all because uh, we spent I guess about 24 years negotiating the American Declar uh, the UN Declaration. And it was another 17 years for the American Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So every word and every phrase was, you know, parsed and inspected very carefully by the different countries of the world. And now what is really important is for people, Indigenous peoples, to determine what are their urgent priorities or what do they wish to address you know, first and then deal with others later? And to me, that would be the approach how to, how to address all of this. It's just too broad to, you know, for someone on the outside to select certain SDGs. And the last thing I would say is always consider the SDGs bringing in also indigenous laws 
indigenous perspectives, give it a context that fits. What fits one nation or people who are indigenous may not be what is the priority for another nation who may have different challenges or a different history. And then there's residential schools. So it really has to come uh, best from indigenous peoples. And even if one goes one way and another one goes another way, they're all legitimate. They're all urgent. And they're, you know, they should be dealt with that way. Thank you. Thanks for that, Paul. I really appreciate the point about diversity of needs, diversity of contexts, diversity of opinions. Uh, sometimes that gets overlooked or um, there's a presumption that all indigenous people would have the same perspective on any question um, and development is certainly where there's a lot of diversity of uh, opinions and views and um, desires for moving forward. So I have my handy dandy little UN declaration booklet um, and I just want to um, highlight a few of the articles in the UN declaration that link very explicitly and clearly to sustainable development, but also draw attention to some of the articles that um, touch on it or involve it in, in some way. Now, my prefacing remark is it's important not to think of each of these articles as a unique entity. The declaration is a holistic document. It should always be read as a whole. However, individual articles are very illustrative and instructive and, and draw our attention to particular spaces. So if we go first of all to Article 23 of the De UN Declaration, this focuses on the right of Indigenous peoples to determine and develop priorities and strategies for exercising their right to development. And so this means, again, involvement in discussions um, of acknowledging indigenous jurisdiction, exclusive jurisdiction where it exists, and where there's overlapping or connected jurisdictions to engage in a relational process that could be co-management, co-development, co-governance, um, those types of ideas must be on the table in order to uphold the UN Declaration. And then also Article 32, which says that Indigenous peoples similarly have the right to determine and develop priorities and strategies for the development or use of their lands or territories and other resources. And then the follow-up paragraphs uh, describe in very particular language what the obligations of nation states are in order to ensure that indigenous peoples can exercise the right articulated in 32. But that's not exclusive. We have um, references to sustainable development all throughout the declaration. So I just wanna highlight a few. Article 18 says indigenous peoples have the right to participate in decision-making in matters that would affect their rights and to do so through their own representatives and in accordance with their own procedures. And then 19, just after that, requires that states must consult and cooperate in good faith with the indigenous peoples concerned through those representative institutions and governance systems in order to obtain consent before adopting legislation or other measures that affect them. And then if we could hop over to 24, I think this is worth mentioning because when we don't have sustainable development and we have devastating impacts to the lands um, and resources on which we're all living, it impacts traditional practices, traditional medicines, health practices. And so Article 24 is directed at that, that indigenous peoples do have the right to their traditional practices, traditional medicines, which include conservation of vital plants, animals, and minerals on, on their territory, and that they have the right to access these without discrimination. And we could go on and on. Um, and I think you could start reading in um, into 
probably the majority of articles in the declaration, linkages and connections and logical coherence uh, between the articles of the UN Declaration and the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, if one were uh, an analyst, you could probably create a, a matrix and a, and a crosswalk and, and very clearly find uh, the principles in both documents. Great. Thanks to both of you. And yeah, that's absolutely true. And I know that a little bit of the fact sheets that the coalition has developed do a little bit of that work. Um, and one of the things I might note um, uh, for those of you who have followed the evolution of the SDGs, um, of course, the one of the big complaints about the Millennium Development Goals that preceded the SDGs was that work by the international community to develop Millennium De Development Goals um, really excluded Indigenous peoples, much as has how Cheryl had explained to us, um, Indigenous peoples were excluded in the work that was done post-World War II at the UN. So uh, in, the, in the development of the SDGs, there was a um, uh, an awareness of that being a failing of the MDGs. Um, so thanks very much for that. Now, one thing, oh, Paul, did you want to add to that? Well, I just wanted to say in doing any of the SDGs or no matter what one does with Indigenous peoples, it's important, I uh, just thought to mention two discrepancies from what the, Canada, what the highest court in Canada says, the Supreme Court of Canada, and what the UN Declaration says. The Declaration says in Article 40 that there's a right to an effective remedy for all infringements. And the Supreme Court, who started their cases before the Declaration but never changed, um, they say that um, that you can in fact infringe indigenous people's rights. And they don't just say it once or twice. I found as much as 30 or 40 references in a single case to infringement. So this is a huge discrepancy. Infringement was one of the central reasons there is a UN declaration or an American declaration. It's been all the violations that resulted in that. And the other thing I just wanted to mention quickly, and this is an important one, again, the UN Declaration and the American Doc Declaration talks about consultation and cooperation with Indigenous peoples. And the Supreme Court of Canada has developed all their jurisprudence to date on just, cooper on just consultation. Well, cooperation changes the whole atmosphere and the whole way of working together. If you're working in cooperation, you're trying to respect each other's views and come to a way of working together. If you're just consulting, and that's what led to a lot of the problems in the case law, corporations would just consult and then do whatever they wanted. So the violations continued. So these are the two big changes that NGOs could be aware of and not go the way of the Supreme Court. And I believe that uh, ultimately the Supreme Court will have to change because if you check, uh, Cheryl referred to the federal legislation to implement the UN Declaration. It's all about consultation and cooperation. So parliament is saying that is the standard and the Supreme Court of Canada, like other courts, have to respect Parliament. They can't go against Parliament. Thank you. Thanks, Paul, for adding that. And maybe I'll just comment a little further on um, what you just were sharing about consultation and cooperation, um, or consultation and collaboration, um, and the, that being a very important standard um, in the new federal bill. I guess I have a two-part question for both of you. Um, one is uh, around the, this um, uh, uh, new standard um, and how will that affect um, the idea of when we're talking about sustainable development, there's challenges with different jurisdictions, um, right? There may, be, there may be a federal uh, component, there may be a provincial or territorial component, 
Um, uh, there may be uh, land on a traditional indigenous territory. And when we're looking at all those jurisdictions and overlapping, um, how can we look at that principle of collaboration and cooperation? Um, and, uh, and in addition to that, which is a big enough question as it is, um, I also wanted to, because it sort of ties a bit into that, I also wanted um, both of you uh, to reflect a little bit on, um, in certainly I think that the, we saw quite a bit of it in the development of the federal legislation, less of it in the development of the BC provincial legislation, but in the development of the federal legislation, we saw some criticisms um, and perhaps I would go so far as to say misrepresentations of the UN declaration itself. Um, and of course, then also of the legislation. So um, I think that I might just ask you both to comment on that in terms of understanding, being sure, we wanna make sure people are getting good information on the declaration. Um, and um, so um, I would just ask you to comment a little bit on that, both on the, um, information around the declaration, but then also using this new standard when we're talking about conflicting jurisdictions. Uh, who would like to start with that? I'll go ahead and set the stage and then let Paul take it from there. Um, I, I think one of the biggest misrepresentations that I heard, um, especially in conversations around the federal um, declaration bill, but also in BC, it wasn't quite as loud and it wasn't quite as front page, but the conversation was going on here as well, is that somehow um, the declaration gives Indigenous people a veto power over all development everywhere. Um, and um, I think in my view, this is nothing short of just fear mongering. There's nothing in the declaration and Paul can speak uh, much more specifically to this point uh, and I welcome him to do that. There's nothing in the declaration about vetoes. There is a lot in the declaration about cooperation, working together, relational approaches. And so I think the hard fact is we do have overlapping jurisdictions in this country. We have a federal level, we have provincial level, we have municipal level. Um, it's not always easy to come to agreements when you have different jurisdictions. Um, the provinces often disagree with the federal. We have municipalities that often disagree with the province. We have ways of coming to agreements. Generally, they're sitting, they mean sitting down at a table and expressing one's views and hearing the others and coming to some sort of compromise resolution. Uh, Generally speaking, we know how to do that as a society. So what, what the Declaration Acts, whether in BC or federally, are really encouraging further is that Indigenous peoples must be at those tables. Um, and that means um, doing some work to find out who are the right people to sit at the table, who are the different legal jurisdictions that need to be part of those conversations, and how do we work out disagreements and discrepancies. And um, that's a huge challenge. Uh, but in order to do that um, peacefully and in uh, an organized framework where people feel heard, their voices are part of the conversation. We just have to figure out how we're going to do that. Um, so I'm going to toss it over to Paul because I know he has plenty to add um, to that particular conversation. I was to say, Cheryl, you set a great basis for this uh, conversation. There are different aspects. One of them is, is I think you mentioned, Jennifer, veto. They're all worried about free prior and form consent, and they said, oh, this is a veto. And we've tried to explain over and over, the federal government got it, but not always do uh, certain provinces get it or developers. And that is that um, it's not about absolute rights. Veto is an absolute right where regardless of the facts and law, you just say no. And that's not what the declaration is about. And the proof is in the last article of the declaration. When we were trying to convince the federal government to um, support the right of all peoples, all indigenous peoples to self-determination, they felt, and so did many countries around the world, that this was too scary, too threatening. 
And so that's why we have Article 46.3. And what it says is, it says, the provision set forth in this declaration shall be interpreted in accordance with the principles of justice, justice democracy, respect for human rights, equality, non-discrimination, good governance and good faith. Now, these are the very principles of the legal system in Canada and other countries. And they are also the principles that often have been denied Indigenous peoples throughout history. So that was favorably looked at ultimately on both sides, the Indigenous side and the states. And it gave them some comfort. The other comfort that the states received is Article 46.2. And that one, we put in a little of both. First of all, it says, the human rights and fundamental freedoms of all shall be respected. We wanted something very clear that the bottom line is Indigenous peoples have human rights and they have to be respected. And um, so then it then goes on to say, the, the rights in the declaration shall be subject only to such limitations as are determined by law and in accordance with human rights obligations. So again, I won't read the rest of that paragraph, but each time we put in balancing provisions that were fair to states that they could identify with and indigenous peoples also really needed that to be said, you know, that it's in accordance with international human rights obligations. In other words, states were not just free through their legislative powers to do whatever they wanted and if, if they wanted undermine the rights. So this declaration includes many uh, balancing provisions that only over time uh, one can appreciate how to use it in a way to be fair to all. Thanks. Thank you, uh, both of you, for those responses. Um, uh, so now I would uh, like to ask another question, and um, really this comes to my mind out of um, watching again the lovely film, uh, the lovely short video we saw where Julian Napoleon is talking a little bit about his work in his community, and he's also talking about uh, meeting needs by living on the land. So the question is, um, you know, one of the criticisms um, that many Indigenous peoples have made globally around the SDGs is that there is, in that in the global um, context, there's an a, over a, too much focus on um, both income and also market economy, <coughs> and perhaps also on what is the definition of poverty. And in that video, what Julian is talking about is about the importance of a form of development that's about sustaining the ways of Indigenous peoples who live on the land. And Paul, you also mentioned earlier um, about Indigenous laws, and I think that ties in here. So instead of looking at things through a Western um, a viewpoint of looking at a market economy or looking at development in terms of income and uh, but looking at how Indigenous peoples can meet their needs by living on the land. What, and how is the declaration uh, make a contribution to how we could understand the SDGs in this regard? Um, and I think as an Indigenous person who has lived um, in an urban space for most of my life, um, who's from a reserve that is in a space and through a unique set of, of history where there's not a large enough land base or contiguous land base to live off the land. Um, it's a complex situation. Um, it has to do with um, checkerboarding of, of land title on the, on the reserve and uh, different ownership. So there's some fee simple lands, there's some um, federal lands, and then there's some, um, I'm, on, I'm from the American side, so we also have allotted lands. Um, and so it's a complex web of um, 
our, our, our land. Of course, the traditional territory is much, much larger than that. Um, but on that territory, um, the question of hunting and fishing is ever so contestable and sometimes quite violently in that particular region. So the ability of people in that reserve to live off the land because of this complex history and, and series of dispossessions is minimal to none. Um, so it does necessitate a consideration of income and poverty. And I think um, when I hear about um, peoples that do have the capacity in the land base and the the natural resources to to live off the land, hunting and fishing and and growing um, their own food. I think that is fantastic. It's just not the case for a lot of us um, because of how we're positioned um, and and certain historical realities. And it definitely takes on a different character for those of us who live in urban spaces and may have connections to the reserve lands in our traditional territories, but not on a day-to-day -day, uh, fashion. So um, I think my, my larger point is that the declaration, and I hope um, the SDGs can th begin thinking in this way as well, needs to take into account that diversity, everything from um, land-based living to some kind of hybrid to an urban space and consider the need for indigenous peoples to exist and, and have a sense of well-being in all of those um, and, and respect all of them as part of the whole. Uh, so that's just a, a personal note uh, from my own uh, personal experiences and, and family connections. So I'll toss over to Paul and, and see what his thoughts are on that. Um, yeah, poverty has been defined uh, there are many definitions. One is a denial of human rights and dignity. And that goes, it seems to reflect uh, Julian's comments. And I've often felt that when uh, we've, as you know, Jennifer, met with people in communities where there are a huge amount of problems and they are impoverished. And, um, you know, often they say, you know, don't, don't say we're poor. We were impoverished. We're not poor. We were rich in ways of lands, territories, culture. And it's more colonization or colonialism and discrimination, et cetera, that, you know, change things around. So yes, poverty is very important. And the fact that it's been, at least in one def definition, that defined as a denial of human rights and dignity, I think is very appropriate from what I've heard from indigenous peoples. The other thing is, um, as has been said internationally, human rights is the common language of humanity. You can have all these different countries. You can have all these different indigenous peoples coming from, you know, every, uh, region of the world. And how do we all communicate? Well, the common language is human rights. And so, you know, then it becomes easier if we keep in mind the need for dignity and the need to get out of poverty. And it should be an objective of states as well as indigenous peoples because it doesn't serve anyone's interest. And it's done huge damage to indigenous peoples by impoverishing them when in fact they had all these lands and territories and rich cultures, etc. So how did one go from there to suddenly being so impoverished? So I think by giving more understanding to what poverty signifies in the indigenous context, not just in any context, but in the indigenous context, taking into account the specific history and current challenges and discrimination indigenous people still face, we can come closer to meeting the needs and the priorities of indigenous peoples, including probably Julian's. Thanks. Thank you, Paul. 
Okay, thanks uh, to both of you for that. Um, okay, I've had another question come in um, from one of our uh, audience members, um, which is if you could, uh, if you have any other examples um, beyond that great example that Paul shared about the Yukon legislation, um, but if there are other examples that perhaps you could share about the implementation of the declaration um, in partnership with a, a sustainable development agenda um, and where you see that going well, the implementation of the two things together, if you have any examples. And obviously that could be, um, you know, here in Canada or it could also be in other places of the world. I know Cheryl often has great examples from other areas of the world, but uh, where can we look for examples, good examples of implementation in that sustainable development context? Okay, I'm going to toss out a couple um, just and, and encourage folks to go look deeper into these um, and and see where the sustainable development agenda is um, perhaps not as prominent as it should be and those connections made not quite as clear as they should be but just food for thought I'm going to put a couple examples on the table. Um, in a, in a similar context to Canada is the country of New Zealand, Aotearoa, New Zealand. And they are, along with us in Canada, almost simultaneously working on a national plan of action for implementing the declaration there. And of course, it's a very different context. Um, there's really only one Indigenous people, Maori, that uh, the government is is interacting with, um, one language group, um, and, and a, a single national treaty. So it's a very different uh, landscape politically. But they are doing some intensive work right now, um, simultaneous with us in Canada, about developing a national plan of action for them in their country. And some of the important notes that I'm aware of there involve um, developing um, not just a consultation framework, like Paul was describing, where government holds all the power and Indigenous peoples get to have a little bit of input into the power. They are working on a model where um, there are overlapping spheres of governance and that the ongoing situation would be much more of a cooperative co-governance model where issues uh, that pertain to Indigenous peoples, which of course means land, environment, and sustainability will be involved. So I think that's one place to watch. It, it's active. Um, they're taking a different pathway than we are in Canada in that we did legislation first, which then um, invites the action plan. They're flipping that. And so they're working on the action plan first with hopes that the legislation will come at the end in order to seal um, the action plan. So two different approaches um, to very similar work. And then um, there's another initiative I'd like to draw attention to and, and, and invite folks to go dig deeper on it um, is the system-wide action plan um, at the United Nations. And, and this creates a set of expectations on UN agencies that are on the ground uh, around the world that they will actively consider the UN declaration in their work. So if we look across the global south where a lot of these agencies are active, um, I think we can start to see some movements or at least uh, the beginnings of movements of integrating um, the UN declaration into their work. And there's a set of connections that I think uh, would be active on the ground development between the SDGs and the UN declaration. So again, two spaces to, to watch and go uh, look deeper. Great. Uh, Paul, did you want to add to that? Uh, um... Aside from the SDGs, of course, we have Transforming Our World, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And that's really important. First of all, that resolution, I haven't been able to keep up, but I've found that that resolution has been reaffirmed by the UN General Assembly by consensus 
at least 88 times, but I'm probably far behind. But it just shows that there is a consensus how to um, approach sustainable development. And of course, transforming our world goes together with the SDGs. And transforming our world makes clear that indigenous peoples must not be considered last. In fact, the poorest, or I forget how they phrased it, but they should be considered first. So this, again, really, um, it takes a consensus position by all states around the world said over and over, I think every year they repeat that clause in there that says you consider those who are last, they've got to go first and that includes indigenous peoples. So that changes the priority and we're basing it on something that is a, a standard for the whole world and confirmed and reaffirmed and reaffirmed. So that's where I would start in terms of being fair and just or to achieve that fairness and justice and eliminate poverty. Thanks. Great, thank you both. And I know that uh, I should say that one of the, this whole project that we've been doing um, this year on uh, the UN Declaration and Sustainable Development, one of the reasons that we didn't call it the UN Declaration and SDGs is because we really did want our project to be bigger than just the SDGs and to look at that whole uh, framework um, from the 2030 agenda. We felt that was quite important because it's a bigger picture and people are often, um, they've heard of the SDGs, um, that's something that is, is more commonly referred to, but um, the 2030 agenda um, for sustainable development does give us a bigger picture uh, to be looking at for um, when we're talking about the, the international um, standards around sustainable development. Um, now, just I see that we're coming up pretty close to our time. Um, I do want to um, give one last uh, um, plug for our symposium. Please do check it out. Um, and I would also say Cheryl held up for a moment earlier her copy of the UN declaration that's in the booklet form. And I would say for those of you who are interested in getting um, one copy or 10 or 100, um, we have them, uh, we have copies of them. It's a project of the coalition was to print um, uh, those pocket versions of the declaration. And Craig will put um, <clears throat> uh, in the chat, the uh, again, the declaration uh, coalition um, address and from that website you can um, uh, you can order booklets. Um, uh, there's a spot on there where you can order booklets. Um, now I just see that one last question came in and maybe I'm going to ask um, Cheryl and Paul if they could give us some closing remarks. We have a hard stop in 10 minutes if they wanted to give some closing remarks but in your closing remarks if you could speak to this uh, to the idea of the importance of Indigenous knowledge, um, uh, the importance of Indigenous knowledge, which really is also what Julian was talking about in that video. But if you can speak to the importance of Indigenous knowledge in the achievement of the SDGs um, and also uh, in, in the protection and recognition by the Declaration, so that uh, uh, in terms of rights to culture, language, and education, um, as being connected. So I'm going to ask you to give some wrap up remarks and to think of that question um, as you give your remarks. Um, Cheryl, I'm going to ask you to go first as uh, you let us off and then uh, and then Paul will uh, Paul will come after you, Cheryl. Thanks, Jennifer. And I think um, that is the big question of the day is um, how to uh, work so that um, Indigenous knowledge, culture, language, education, rights of children, rights of women, rights of elders um, are all protected um, in both the UN Declaration Framework and the Sustainable Development Framework. Um, and I think it, it sounds simplistic, but it, it bears repeating um, that the UN Declaration is a holistic document um, that contains all of these different parts. And the philosophy is that 
it is comprehensive and it is holistic when we talk about indigenous knowledge, wellness, well-being, um, life, life ways, livelihoods. None of these can be separated from one another. They're all interconnected and intertwined. And um, protecting the environment and indigenous peoples goes hand in hand. Um, there's no way to extricate one from the other. So we have to keep all of these goals in mind in a holistic fashion. Um, the knowledge of how to live sustainably, sustainably on the land is indigenous knowledge. It has been here since time memorial. And uh, what we want to be sure as humans is that it remains here in, as part of our, our future and not just our past. So I think there are natural alignments and multiple alignments uh, between the sustainable development goals and the UN declaration. And I just encourage everyone um, to work um, in those interconnected and integrated and holistic ways, uh, moving both agendas forward. Yeah, thank you, Cheryl, that's put in a very nice context. Um, I'll just make a couple of comments. One is that there have been two expressions. One is indigenous traditional knowledge and the other is indigenous knowledge. And we've worked with um, some real, I mean, real strong indigenous leaders and they've insisted don't use the expression indigenous traditional knowledge. Use the expression indigenous knowledge. Our knowledge encompasses that whole holistic, you know, context. There's nothing that we need another adjective to say, oh no, your knowledge. It's only the traditional stuff. So, and it leads to just a distortion, you know, and we've heard this very strongly from Indigenous leaders. Um, the other thing I'd suggest is the SDGs, unfortunately, when they were being developed, largely excluded Indigenous peoples. When they were involved, you won't find in the SDGs much mention of the term Indigenous. And I think that going using the SDGs, not, 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 I'm not suggesting not using them, but it's important to put it in the broader context of the 2030 agenda. And that one very explicitly said, you know, you cannot leave indigenous peoples to, uh, behind and you must deal those who are furthest behind first. So there was an ability through the different resolutions coming, you know, connected to the 2030 agenda that made a broader context, a fairer context. So the SDGs have a definite important place, but don't forget the broader context where it came from. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and as we're about to run out of time, I'm going to uh, uh, just wrap us up here today. And it's been, so great to hear from Paul and Cheryl, um, both about the UN Declaration, some of the history, some of the negotiating language in the Declaration, the development of legislation, both at the provincial level, territorial level, federal government level, how we might see that implementing, how we see implementation happening in other countries around the world um, by the United Nations, and how we can marry all of that work to work uh, that people are doing on sustainable development, um, tying in to the SDGs and, of course, more broadly, to transforming our world, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And of course, these are all big topics. Um, and I think that uh, we have to thank our speakers for being able to give us so much information in, uh, in our brief time together this afternoon. And I also just want to thank all of our partners in the Coalition for the Human Rights of Indigenous Peoples for all the work that's gone into our um, uh, sustainable development project this year and moving into our uh, symposium next month. And I especially want to thank my colleague, uh, Craig Benjamin, who's been the lead on this project and moving this uh, project forward. So um, many thanks to Craig. Uh, many thanks for those of you who are able uh, to join us here this afternoon. And I hope that you uh, have enjoyed our presentation. And with that, I think we're going to let the organizers of the conference breathe a little bit early.
um, that we are going to close off three minutes early rather than going to the hard stop of 2.45. So thanks for being with us here today um, for this, uh, this interesting side event. <laughs>